Then to Charlene. According to this um, guideline for commenting on the scope of the EIS, um, some examples of information NRC is requesting are, um, I'm going to skip to the second one, what reasonable alternatives to the proposed action should be analyzed and why? I think the reasonable alternative that should be examined is Sure, if these casks are so safe, great. Let's distribute them to the places where the nuclear power plants are. And um, I think this would be safer because you wouldn't, having a centralized target for terrorism is a dumb idea. And, um, I, I know that they're vulnerable just being in pools with a roof over them or whatever. I don't know enough about that. I'd like to know more. But if, if these dry casks are really so great, and um, I want to thank um, John McKiergan for explaining to me how they actually go about putting the fuel rods into these casks. It's um, done underwater. Um, and then there's a, a drying out process where helium, an inert gas, replaces the water vapor that's left. And I like that. And I think it's a great idea. And I think they should stay right there. <laughs> where they've lived their whole active lives. Um, also, he did mention that a tiny bit of water vapor, can you all hear me? Uh, would probably remain inside the cask, but uh, only a tiny amount. But that um, radiation escaping uh, the inner container, the, the stainless steel cask, which someone mentioned is only a half inch thick, and in Europe they, they use ones that are much bigger. I wonder why NRC is considered the model if Europe has something better. But um, something's funny. Oh, great, good. Um, so uh, anyway, the little bit of radiation that can exist inside the larger cask could cause that water vapor to separate into hydrogen and oxygen. And hydrogen, of course, is explosive in the presence of oxygen. So that sounded to me like a concern. I hope that um, that, that can be controlled somehow. Um, Maybe it's not enough, maybe I didn't understand you completely, but maybe it's not enough to cause harm. But um, I also learned from talking with you, John, about the fact that when the fuel rods are first transported to the nuclear power plants, they're, they're not as hot as they are later, because as uranium breaks down, giving off this tremendous energy that's used to boil water, to drive turbines to make electricity. Um, they break down into other radioactive elements. And so some of those have longer half-lives or instead of alpha, maybe they've got beta or gamma radiation. So, so the things actually get hotter. Um, and this is a concern to me. But what I'd like to uh, move to is what local sources of information should the NRC consider? I think you've already heard eloquent uh, testimony from the dairy industry, and I know you're going to hear about the pecans that we grow here, which are yummy. And, um, and then you've heard about the immense amount of oil that we're sitting on 
that could be at risk. Um, what I'd like to look at in terms of local information, and I don't mean just local to southeast New Mexico, I'm talking about the state as a whole. We have paid our nuclear dues. Starting at the Trinity site, where the first bomb was test exploded, the people of the Tularosa Basin who lived, I forget, 16, 18 <coughs> miles away, were never warned, were never acknowledged. They suffer still. Even the ones who've moved away from that poisoned community have children who develop cancers that are, thyroid cancers especially, that are associated with exposure to radiation. Karen, I'm going to ask you to sum up, please. All right, I will. Other people have mentioned the Navajo miners, and it wasn't just Navajos, it was also Laguna Pueblo people. A woman named Dorothy Purley testified in the 90s at an event that was sponsored by CARD. Oh, and I forgot to say I'm a member of CARD and a retired teacher. She testified about how she was given no warning and no protection as she drove trucks full of mine, um, mining of the uranium ore to the milling sites and all the dust that she was inhaling and so forth. She was already dying of cancer at that time. It's environmental racism all over the state. The first nuclear victims to be compensated were white. They were the Utah Mormon downwinders. One of them was also at this dinner honoring atomic veterans. And she said, we are the most patriotic people in the United States, Mormons. We could not believe our government did this to us. Then, finally, after a while, after a lot of legal and work. Karen, I'm gonna have to ask you to wrap up, please. Yes. Navajos began to be compensated, but not the ones in New Mexico, and not the ones who worked in mines and mills after 1970. There's so many gaps. We have paid our dues, and we have not, some of us, the most vulnerable, not been compensated or acknowledged. That's it. And uh, Karen, just for the record, could you tell people what CARD stands for? I don't oh, know what yes. people know. Yes, CARD stand, and I've only been a member for a few short years, although I attended many of the hearings that they invited me to. Uh, it stands for Citizens for Alternatives to Radioactive Dumping. We don't want our state to be a dump. Thank you. And that's a New Mexico group? Yes. Okay. It formed when WIC was first being discussed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. All right. And is Ira Hernandez, and then we're going to go to Janet Greenwald. And then we're going to go to uh, Ikea. 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 Good evening, everybody. <coughs> My name is Charlene Hernandez, and I was born in Capitan, New Mexico in 1945. No, actually, it was 1946. My mom was pregnant with me when the atomic bomb at Trinity site was exploded. Okay. So, uh, that said, I want to say that I agree with most of the speakers that spoke tonight, and I hope you listened well because this is my state where I was born, and we were already blasted once, and we're still suffering the effects from that atomic bomb blast. Now, if this is so safe, like these people have said here, why does it cost so much for cleanup? I have read that it costs not just hundreds, not just thousands, but billions of dollars to clean up after a said problem with these waste containers like we had at Carlsbad, okay? That was shut down for two years. When I looked in the computer, the RECA Act is uh, Radiation Compensation, Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. 
It was passed in Colorado, Utah, parts of Arizona, but not New Mexico. Well, I've been keeping track with Senator Udall, who says that they're trying to expand the law to cover New Mexico, and that means they will compensate people who have relatives who have certain cancers, and they'll, they will pay people up to $50,000 for each loss for certain cancers. They will also pay your medical costs. If you're found to have those certain cancers, they'll pay your medical bills until you die. Now, n not too many people know about that. I'm making that discovery, and it's a sad thing. Why are New Mexico people always the last to know? And why did they pick New Mexico? They picked New Mexico to test the atomic bomb, and they didn't ask anybody. I mean, scientists that didn't know what was going to happen did it to us. Now, Lincoln County used to be where they had the very best apples. You go over there now, you can't find a single good apple bigger than that. We had big, huge apples, wonderful apples, different kinds of apples, not just one few little kinds. You know, we had several different kinds of apples. Now nothing, nothing grows that's bigger than that. A lot of contamination has happened. I agree very much with the scientist who spoke earlier, Mr. Um, he was Steve Shuffleman, Schaeferman. It was Okay, he was from Texas. I totally agree with him, 200 percent. The stability of this place is not good. I was in my house one day when my house shook like in California when I was out there. I said, what's up with that? My house shook. The ground is not s stable here. And that man was absolutely correct. Now, did you hear about the new caves that they found in Fort Stanton? The longest cave in the nation. Or, uh, vertically like this, or horizontal, whatever. But it's the longest one, more than 30 miles. The end of that cave is at the bottom of the Rodoso Airport. It ends there. It's a beautiful cave. And then my cousin said to me, oh, my cousins live there. They said, Charlene, that cave connects up to the Lincoln, more other caves that are there and probably the Carlsbad Cave. So I think that you pay attention to that gentleman. I think he had it all exactly correct and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. And thank you for being here and for looking into this situation. I hope you can come to a good conclusion that this is not a safe state. My suggestion is, is to let the people who have the re, re, um, those things where the radioactive waste is made, the nuclear reactor people who have those, they could keep it in their own place where they have their reactors, not send Thank it you. somewhere else. Thank, Thank you, you, Charlene. You're welcome. And uh, we're going to go to uh, Janet Greenwald. And then we're going to have uh, Ikea, or Queso, come up. And uh, then Susie Bell, Goss Lee, Soya Stevens, Alfredo Dominguez, and Stephen Picha, I think. And this is Janet. Hi, I'm Janet Greenwald. I'm a, a coordinator of uh, Citizens for Alternatives to Radioactive Dumping. And um, it, that was an organization formed uh, 39 years ago by people in this part of the state. Uh, I'd like to report to you from a community that's close to a nuclear facility. It's the community where I raised my uh, children a beautiful uh, little place in the Ambudo Valley, which some people consider the organic uh, bread basket of New Mexico. It's in northern New Mexico. Um, this community is a bedroom community from Los Alamos, and it's also directly downwind from Los Alamos. Over a decade ago, there was a fire there, the Cerro Gordo fire, and um, after that, the uh, New Mexico Environment Department visited the valley and they said, 
There's cobalt in your plums, and there's cesium in your broccoli, but don't worry about it. It's below a regulatory concern. And then several months later, my daughter-in-law became pregnant, and um, a, a few months later, she lost one of her twins. And that was the first time in our memory, but well, we have twins on both sides of the family, the first time anyone lost a twin. And then they found out that the remaining twin's fallopian tube was malformed. So then she had a double risk pregnancy. So in order to have her uh, baby in the Española hospital, my son and uh, she had to look through this book of the deformed babies uh, from Española Hospital. We're talking about badly deformed babies. No arms, etc. And they had to look through this book because they had to decide if their baby was born deformed, uh, would they want to hold it after it was born or did they just want someone to take it away? So um, we were very lucky because Olivia was born whole. But Española is also downwind and a bedroom community for Los Alamos. Not long after that, we found out that one of the um, mountain lakes that feeds the uh, river that goes through the Ambudo Valley had so much cesium around its shore that it was close to being a super fun uh, site. This is the headwaters of the Embudo River and also the Rio Grande. Then, um, the other day, Olivia and her brother Ezra and I went to the, uh, to the um, library in this little community. And on the door, there was a sign and it said, support group for contaminated Los Alamos workers. 9 a.m. on Saturday morning. So what do you think? Are nuclear facilities a benefit to the communities around them? Perhaps you've had a different experience than I've had. But you can judge from what I've said. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Paikia, could I ask you to come up, and this is Paikia Marqueso, and I can hold this for you, or do you want to hold it? I can hold it. Thank okay, Paikia. My name is Paikia Marcus, and I am 11 years old. I'm here on behalf of unborn kids and born kids like me. I think this whole situation is very important because it affects everything and everybody. It affects the plants and wildlife around them. I have recently been writing an essay about ecosystems and how it can be changed and affected and damaged and helped up again and, you know. But um, I read that ecosystems can be very easily poisoned through water, air and soil water is if it if all this radiation leaks into the water everything needs water everything that living that's living needs water it's going to suck up all of that and it's going to get poisoned my house it has a pump we pump underground water to our house and we use it for everyday necessities. What if that gets poisoned? That we will get poisoned in all of our produce, our, our garden. My dad planted a bunch of trees. Is that going to get poisoned too? We also are pecan farmers too and we have, get a living off that too. And we use it for our food. We also have, we also grow chili, tomatoes, and a lot of other stuff. Is that going to be affected too? Who is going to be, you know, who's going to give us back all that produce that we 
just probably lost. Who's going to be, you know, the, who's going to pay for it? Who's going to, like, you know, reimburse us for it? I don't, I've been reading this book on uh, climate change. It says radioactivity does contribute to climate change. It doesn't really produce that much carbon dioxide, but at the same time, it still does affect, and if you see the microwave, that's radiation. Imagine a microwave in the world. The whole world is a microwave. Microwaves make heat. That's gonna be contributing to climate change. It's going to be contributing to a lot, a whole lot of problems. You may think you might be solving a problem, but really you're just creating more problems to solve. And they might just be forever. You might just not be able to solve them. So um, please do remember that I cannot vote. So you need to vote for this because I don't really have a vote for this. So please do vote against this horrible, horrible mistake. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, that'll be a hard act to follow. But, uh, uh, Susie Bell? Yes. I'm sorry. I've been saying so long. I'm paralyzed. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's been one of those nights. Do you want to sit down and have me hold no. this for you? No. Okay. All right. Sorry. I'm I'm Susie Bell Gosling. I'm testifying as a member and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Texas regarding the license application for the consolidated interim storage facility has been described today. We appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today and thank you for allowing us to share the League of Women Voters of Texas position on this issue. We are very concerned about many aspects of the high-level radioactive waste disposal, uh, the storage proposal. Most importantly, the health, safety of people and the environment and the transportation risks. Our position on hazardous materials and high-level radioactive materials like other league positions, is derived through a lengthy and thoughtful process involving the participation of 25 city leagues representing our members and supporters throughout the state of Texas. We support the League of Women Voters of New Mexico. Neither Holtec International, WCS, or any other company should be allowed to develop an interim storage location without an approve a, a plan for a permanent disposal site and a robust system for storage. Doing other site-wise would not protect local residents, their health, or the environment from having this temporary site become a permanent site. What is the plan for locating a permanent repository for this hazardous material? More specific information is needed by a verifiable independent third party to authenticate the suitability of the proposed New Mexico and Texas sites by using data accumulated with most up-to-date research in addition to the past data that's been accumulated. A conflict of interest and the appearance of a conflict of interest should be avoided. Transport issues, issue, transportation issues are of great concern. We have a number of questions concerning those in addition to the ones that have been presented. Accidents do happen. They said that there would be, um, you know, the, the Titanic would not sink, and it did. I can go on with numerous examples. What would be the standards and guarantees for the railroads routes for this highly radiated material? What would be the financial assurances provided by the railroad companies, the states, and Holtec International. How would the financial assurances be monitored? Who would inspect and monitor these systems? What would be the penalties if the safety and financial uh, assurances are not adequate? 
there are many questions that are posed in the paper that I will submit online. I would also like to say, since the time is so limited, the same questions for the railroads apply for the roads and the highways that would be carrying the heavy high-level radioactive waste. How much transport of high-level radioactive waste would be on the highways? Exactly, really. Heavy, heavy loads do more damage to highways than the, than the lighter traffic. We can learn from past accidents. In fact, you were, there was a comment about the uh, incidents in Sweden, and 80% of the uh, reindeer had to be killed after uh, the Chernobyl site. And every year, reindeer have to be killed in Sweden because of continued contamination, even though that was 30, over 30 years ago. The wind carried the radiation across Sweden, Europe, and northern, the Northern Hemisphere. That can happen also in Texas and in this country. Thank you for having the public comment meeting in Roswell, Cobbs, and Carlsbad, New Mexico. However, none of these cities has easy access by airlines and, is, and are accessible to most people. Meetings should be held in Dallas and Fort Worth, a major hub of transportation by rail, San Antonio, El Paso, Albuquerque, Santa Fe, in addition to maybe major cities across the U.S. that would be highly, likely high radiation transport routes. Thank you for considering the League of Women Voters' comments. Thank you. Thank you. It's Soya Stevens. How about uh, Alfredo Dominguez? Alfredo? And uh, then we're going to try Stephen, P I C H A. I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but Alfredo, welcome. Thank you. My name is Alfredo Dominguez. I lived here in Roswell since 1980. I thought a lot about what I was going to say here tonight, and then when I get here and look at the slides filled, and it says, this purpose is to determine if it's safe to build and operate a consolidated interim storage facility at the proposed site. And I cannot conceive any stretch of imagination how transporting this <coughs> nuclear waste across Texas and the nation is ever going to be safe. Uh, each canister is a target for terrorists that want to do us harm. Terrorists have already used our airlines against us, our postal system. They're trying to hack our our internet to control the nuclear reactors. They are this you're giving them a giant bomb. All they have to do is formulate a shape charge, and they won't set it off at the whole tech site. They'll set it off at the major metropolitan center. And what would be there's there is nothing that can stop. If that happens, there's nothing that will clean that up, ever. Putting licensing the site for 40 years for 500 canisters will not help alleviate the problem of permanent solution there. We just create another site that's going to be contaminated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, is Stephen, Stephen Pitcher here? Tom Gorman? Abraham, Abraham Guevara. Cole Fuller. Okay. How about Morton? Morton Crawl? K R A L? Okay. Larry Martin? Larry. Am I the last one? I know that honor goes to Bill Madison if Bill was here. Is Bill here? Yeah. Bill will be our last speaker. I didn't see anyone come in after me, that's why I said that. Um, I'm sort of neutral on this. I didn't hear about it until yesterday so I think the publicity was lacking although 
I was obviously out of the loop. I suggest, just like Mr. Jennings said, that you get a bigger room. I mean, there's a theater down here with 400 six seats in it. Instead of winning this little dinky little room here where not enough of us can argue with you. I realize you have a problem. you got all this waste sitting around on the East Coast, West Coast that somebody wants to put somewhere else. And that's usually the politicians in those states, not here. Okay. Um, on the other hand, I don't want the politicians in Austin and Santa Fe determining whether or not Roswell gets some. Okay? Um, that may be against a lot of the people who have come in from Santa Fe and have an argument, but Southeast and Southern New Mexico always seem to go on the short end of the stick in the politics in this state. Uh, in uh, Roswell, we have an aquifer. We don't share it with Clovis or Midland. I don't think we share it with Artesia. It's our own little lake down there, and it's very valuable. If it should be polluted, Roswell will dry up and blow away because the industry will leave. I mean, the agriculture will leave, and we're gone. The importance of maintaining a clean aquifer, and that would be a problem if something happened. Uh, would be catastrophic for the hospital. Um, and the reason, uh, or the question I have is, is the location near an aquifer, which I may have missed, you may have said it, I can't remember. Uh, and also, does this um, place have to be cooled? I would imagine so. And uh, the problems with Fukushima, Chernobyl, uh, were cooling problems. In Fukushima, there's still a spot where no human can endure. It's so hot and so polluted. And they don't know what to do with it. So if you have a nuclear problem where you can no longer cool your trash, you are in serious trouble. And it will eventually, just like the old movie, there was a phony movie. Uh, I don't have much more to say other than that, but uh, if something happened where the cooling system failed, such as a <coughs> massive grid failure in this country, you would have approximately 99 uncooled uh, nuclear bombs. Okay? You're talking about half the country totally out of it forever. That's that's what they're trying to prevent, I think. But I don't see anyone arguing the case that you have to maintain these places to be cool. No one talks about it. But that's a major, major fact. Thanks. Okay, thank you for those comments. Bill. Thank you. My name is Bill Madison. Let me get you in there. My name is Bill Madison. Okay. I'm uh, from Roswell. I live in northern New Mexico also. Hold the mic closer. I can't hear you. There. My name is Bill Madison. I live in northern New Mexico. I have property in Roswell that I take care of. I was at the whip hearings when the whip hearings came. And I don't know, you. none of you obviously were there. You're too young. We were told that would, that would be all that would be in New Mexico, and it wouldn't. Be, there would be no high-level radiation in New Mexico. That there would be no accidents. It went. It was fail-safe, one hundred percent fail-safe. So it's hard for me to to uh, kind of embrace what you what's going on here because you, the government has lied to us, blatant lie. So I think that you should look at that and, and understand that we've been told one thing and now all of a sudden there's this new thing that's coming at us. A lot of eloquent speakers today, and there's a lot of information that you folks in this thing that SMU, I'm not aware of it. it sounds kind of interesting. Uh, a fracking coming on in the area and a reintroduction of the uh, liquids uh, causing these Tremors in Oklahoma. Will that happen in the Permian Basin as well? Could obviously there's holes there, and I'm sure you folks are all looking at that. 
but the really main thing is that we've been lied to. So that's my that's my spiel. Thank you for your time and thank you for being here and listening to this. And I, I agree that there I just found out about this today, so but I'm not really in the loop for it. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Madison. In about a minute, I'm going to turn it over to the senior NRC official here, Brian Smith, who's just going to uh, say a few final words. But I think that I mentioned earlier in the evening that the NRC would not be responding to any comments. Well, there's only one time when they do do that when uh, there were statements or implications about NRC's statutory authority or responsibility, and we don't want people to leave thinking that the NRC regulates something that it doesn't. I think he's going to talk about something like that. But before Brian goes on, I just want to thank all of you for your patience and for your comments. Uh, tonight and I have to thank Chief Newberry and his officers again for helping us. And I have to thank Porter's father for bringing Porter in here. Maybe the most sensible sentient being that's here, but I'm not going to go further into that. But Brian, go ahead. All right, thanks, thanks Jim. Uh, I guess the clarification, the one thing there, is uh, the whip side has been mentioned several times and it's been correlated that the NRC has been involved with that. Uh, there's been no NRC involvement with, with the whip side. That's totally under the Department of Energy. So uh, we're not a regulator of, of that site. Um, and just one other thing, uh, clarification. Uh, earlier on in the session, uh, there was a question about has the NRC ever denied an application the context of that, the way I took it, was an application like the one that's that we're talking about here, a uh, consolidated interim storage facility application. Um, and so that's how I answered the question. There's been three of those that have been submitted. One's been approved, one's on hold, and we're reviewing the, the whole tech one now. Uh, but when you look at the NRC as a whole, and we do lots of licensing for lots of different types of, of uses of material, and we have uh, denied licenses applications in the past um, but what typically happens is um, we ask so many questions raise so many issues with certain applications um, that they end up being withdrawn and, and not pursued any further so we do and to get to the point or we don't get to the point where we terminate or, or deny these applications so so those two clarifications there so I just want to thank everyone again for attending the meeting tonight. We appreciate you coming out and, and staying uh, this late as well. Uh, we value all of your comments. And we'll consider those as we prepare our draft EIS. Uh, once the draft EIS is published, I would encourage you uh, to review the document and again provide us any comments that you think that we need to uh, complete the document itself. So thank you again and have a good evening. Thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you. Going nowhere, baby, that's me.